what would happen if humans disappeared from Earth? Tracing and visualizing change in a preschool child's domain-related curiosities. Hello, I am Namta and Amanda, do you want to go? Um, just briefly introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, uh, Amanda Brainy. I'm a postdoctoral scholar from uh, Drexel University School of Education. And I'm the other Amanda, Amanda <laughs> Stevenstone. Uh, I'm a research associate at the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at UW-Madison. Um, so I'm not that again, uh, but I, uh, today I am coming in, or at this conference, I'm coming in not just as a learning scientist in an industry setting, but I'm also coming in as a parent who uh, found an opportunity to bring Huey into her personal life. Um, and I do have a background in human development and I, a part of my education really focused on child development and I'm a mother of a seven-year-old. Um, so all of those things came together. So we, together, Amanda, Amanda and I will be talking about this fun project that the three of us are uh, working on uh, with my son. Um, and let us take you through. Oops. So uh, sort of three goals that we have for this presentation, and we hope that it sort of sparks your interest enough to sort of go back to the larger paper and delve deeper into our study. One is we want to give you a peek into this part self-ethnography and part quantitative ethnography of family engagement, um, a, a routine that I started with my son back in 2018 uh, to sort of facilitate and to nurture his curiosity and to use QE um, techniques, particularly ENA, to trace the shift in his domain-related curiosities over a 10-month period. Um, that's what we'll be presenting today, but this has been an ongoing process, so we are continuing to engage in this research even after um, the period where we're presenting this data. And um, also, since I said, like we hope that this will be a long-term project, uh, we want to think of you know, the opportunities QE has afforded, give you insight into some changes that we have um, introduced in our process um, of memoing, of, of coding, and some future plans that we have as Ridan goes older, and perhaps even share some ideas for people in similar positions who are looking to nurture and trace um, a child's curiosity. So um, before we get into sort of that routine that we established, um, I want to give you a little bit of an insight into the literature around curiosity in young children and the sort of significant role that family engagement plays, particularly adults. So um, we have several reports. I mean, the more popular ones being the National Research Council, Council ones that have sort of argued that preschool age children are demonstrating readiness for science, but what's missing are some pedagogical processes, some mechanisms to sort of nurture children's curiosity, children's entry into science and really um, hone that long-term love for science. Um, I mean, this is something I don't need to argue or sort of you know place much emphasis on that curiosity is central to children's development. There are many ways children demonstrate their curiosity about the world around them. And a big key um, a role that plays into nurturing children's curiosity is social interaction. And this could be in school, this could be in family settings um, and many other um, places where children have opportunities to engage with people their age and people older with them or different from them. Um, and you know, while we're talking about science and children's readiness for science um, and thinking about how children express their curiosity or find a way to learn more about their world is through the process of asking questions and refining questions. And we obviously have the next generation science standards, which also talk about and have looked at the role of questioning opportunities to refine those questions, um, have support to ask those questions and modify questions and learn how to ask questions as being um, sort of catalyst, catalytic to children's development. Um, some work around Philip Bell and uh, learning scientists who study learning in formal learning environments have talked about the role of um, informal learning spaces, informal learning opportunities, such as families, family routines, as, as a great way to foster children's long-term engagement in science. Um, 
And some, there's some really nice papers out there in, in the field of human development that look at family routines. It could be a walk in the neighborhood. It could be dinner time talk. It could be um, you know, a, a visit to a science museum that really show how having those routine opportunities can provide students or not students, but kids or, or learners, young, young people, um, those occasioned or seasoned knowledge exploration opportunities. Um, and in here, the role of adults become crucial because through these guided interactions, um, by, having by having adults share their wealth of knowledge, children can really um, be supported in developing those islands of expertise. And I'll piggyback on one comment that Amanda uh, Seabird Evanstone made just a few minutes before we started was that, you know, so cool for, you know, kids to have different sets of adults to look up to, to go to, and really have those um, unique sets of conversations that they can engage in. And one example being my son goes to Amanda Barini all the time when he wants to talk about Pokemon or Minecraft. And he just sees her as that, you know, someone who he can look up to, to know more about Pokemon and to learn more about it. Like there's a shared interest. He's sort of created that affinity space and Amanda becomes that um, model and mentor to really hone Vidan's expertise in that, in that domain. Um, and as, you know, sort of building upon this, you know, par parents and the role of, oops, sorry, scaffolding um, through these occasion knowledge exploration opportunities, through providing children ways to build knowledge of um, islands of expertise can really help children develop a sense of identity as individuals who, you know, who want to pursue activities that are more aligned with um, their engagement with different academic um, disciplines. And I feel like this, you know, is sort of, you know, relevant to not just science, but any domain in general. So um, in 2018, I was going, I was very busy. I was a postdoctoral scholar. Um, Ridan was a four-year-old child brimming with, you know, just wonderful ideas and questions. And I was busy writing grants. I was managing a lab. I was running my own studies. I was writing papers. I was building everything that you'd want an academic to sort of, you know, want in that CV. And I think, I don't even know how many literal jobs I was running at that time. And at that time I saw my son, you know, literally making comments to his teachers saying, my mother only sits at the computer. She, she basically is working all the time, day and night. And it made me kind of think, you know, here I have this child, you know, he's four year old, he's full of ideas, he's full of, you know, desire to know about the world. How can I, you know, do all the professional work that I want to do, but also nurture his curiosity. And I honestly, at that time, didn't even know what he was interested in at that time, because my mind was just so busy and so chaotic. So I thought about what is that one time that I always am with him, except for when I'm traveling. And that was a bedtime routine. That was one thing I never negotiated on. Even during my busy time, we always read books in the night. And then I would put him to sleep. And I said, hey, how about, you know, um, I'll, I'll go back a slide behind. Um, it was right around the Thanksgiving in the year 2018, where we were reading this book. Um, it was a magic school bus book. And it was some topic about science. I, I don't recall exactly, but we were looking at this, this image and it looked like, you know, what's, what's the first step to being a scientist or to be anything for that matter, whether it's an artist or a mathematician, you need to be curious about things. You need to be curious about that world or that domain and you need to start asking questions. Um, and I was like, hey, why, why don't I, you know, I, uh, you know, we were talking about this and I talked about the role of curiosity and how it manifests through questions. And I offered to the Ridan, I said, what if, um, you know, after we read books, um, you know, I gave you an opportunity to ask one question, anything that you wanted to ask, there would be no barriers, there would be no judgments. And then we would find an answer to it. We would look up a video, it would be a short video, but hopefully it'll answer or satisfy your curiosity. So that led to what I call as a bedtime curiosity or ABC. It had to be easy enough for him to remember and it, was, it had to be easy enough for me to communicate to him. So this um, is a very brief, you know, sort of set of questions that we documented in the first 20 days. Um, and as I said, at that time, when we started, he was in pre-K, uh, 
and we ran this this routine for 10 months so right up until he finished his uh, pre-k year um, and then we paused for the summer just sort of reflecting on um, you know what we wanted to do and I and I remember um, right after we finished and you know sort of the end of summer I was at ICQE I went up to Amanda Siebert Evenstone and I said you know Amanda you you are a mom too I have this really cool project that I'm doing with my son you know take a look at it I think it'll be excellent for us to work on it and then coming back home Amanda and I worked in the same lab I said you know you know Ridan Ridan's basically you know sort of this one person who keeps coming to you all the time let's see what we can learn from this um and I and as as you look at these questions you know we just there's so much that we can learn from it like you know one I created a safe space for him you know he could ask me anything and we would find an answer to it and I thought what what can we learn about it like you know what is he truly interested in as he asks these questions um and one last thing before I hand over to um Amanda e Siebert Evenstone is that every night that we read two books and then asked a question, um, we watched a video which was be like you know no more than five minutes long. What I didn't do at that time, um, and I learned sort of later on, is I didn't memo anything. I didn't document anything at that moment. I had some sort of you know memos in mind, or I could easily say you know what sort of prompted him to ask this question. It could be time of the year or what he did in school or such. But I wasn't as rigorous as I wanted to be in my memoing. Um, and of course, as you see, like, you know, not documenting the resources, not documenting the date. So there were a lot of gaps that we realized in our analysis, which we'll get to um, towards the end. But I will hand over the baton to Amanda Siebert Evenstone. So what did our process look like in terms of um, actually analyzing this data? Amanda, over yeah. to you. So what a fun data set she had me at the first line, it was so cool. Um, so for coding, uh, we looked at, there was 123 questions in this data set, although she's continued uh, this routine, adding more questions over time. Uh, and so we coded for topic. Uh, for example, what happens when bone bones break was coded for anatomy. Uh, for reliability and validity issues, uh, we used social moderation with two coders, uh, coded all of the data and agreed on each code. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're good. Oh, no. Oh. Awkward. Oh. oh. For some reason, it didn't show when I had the full screen on, but oh, there you go. Um. Well, I'll keep talking. Uh, so for data analysis, uh, we used uh, epistemic network analysis uh, using a moving standard window size of two questions so that we could measure uh, connections between a given question and a, and a previous question. Um, to do our analyses, we separated the data in half, so time one versus time two. Uh, and compared these times using a means rotation. Let's look at the results with other Amanda. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Okay, so uh, wait, can you go, there we go. So I always like to look at the, um, for data that's broken up into uh, means rotation time one and time two, I always like to look at the models separately first and understand them before we look at the difference model. Um, so things that you might notice when you're looking at the first half of his questioning and the second half of his questioning, time one and time two, you see in time one, for example, that very strongly weighted connection between manufacturing and engineering and technology. Um, and it's not quite as strong in time two, but you also see that it, uh, the connection to biology and anatomy, while it is strong in both uh, halves of the data, it seems to be slightly stronger in time two. Um, and that's important to point out because it, in the difference model, you'll see that that line is actually rather thin, when in reality, these are topics that uh, that Hidan was talking about all the time, asking questions about all the time. And so this was a very prevalent area for him. You also see um, the thicker line related to astronomy and connecting that to biology. Um, and that is related to his growing interest in astronomy that has continued even beyond the 125 questions we were looking at. So um, after this month, he documented his in-depth examination of astronomy. And actually this spurred our um, later questioning and examination of his curiosity exploration as it, as it grew and changed. Um, you'll also see a, a slight increase in the weighted connections between history and time two as well. And, and that also plays out in some of the data. Um, so if you could move on to the next slide, Mamta, please. 
Okay, so on the right, we see the difference model and some of the trends that we, what we pointed out in um, the models for time one and time two are evident. Um, just remember that biology and anatomy was always something that he uh, asked and made connections to often. Um, but some of the other trends are visible. Uh, but I want to I want to draw your attention to the different scores on the left, um, and I include the difference model next to it so that you can um, you and I can interpret what the movement of these scores is over time as he's exploring these questions. So for context, each of these numbers represents a chunking process that we did um, of ten questions that he asked chronologically. So one is the first ten questions he asked, two the the, the next ten or the uh, ten through twenty. Then we have 20 through 30, et cetera. Um, and so following these numerically, you can kind of get a sense of his trajectories over time. So for number one, he's very solidly situated uh, close to the biology, anatomy, and of course to technology. And so this relates to some of the early questions he asked related to bodily functions um, that you might have saw in the example that Mumta was sharing earlier on. Um, and also relating to some of the more basic questions he was asking up front about how things are made. Um, and that becomes something that he explores. Um, if you would go to the next slide, please, Mamta. That's something that he starts to explore more and more, this manufacturing and engineering theme uh, over the next tw uh, 20 and 30 questions. Um, so he starts asking us, uh, asking Mamta questions about how things are made that he sees around him. How is a pillow made? How's a music box made? How are light bulbs made? Um, how are candy canes made? And this was, this was something that facilitated his exploration into the manufacturing of each of these different things. Um, and that's something that grew over the next uh, chunk of questioning. Then if you look at uh, the next slide, sl um, questions uh, in time five, six, and seven, there is uh, more of a diversification of his exploration. And that's because it's more centrally located in the, in the model. If you look at the scores in relation to um, in relation to the positionality of the nodes. Uh, and so he's, he's asking questions that are a little bit more diverse at this point, a little bit more topically abstract. Um, so he's got questions here about historical topics. This is where that, that theme starts to become more apparent, um, asking things about uh, books that he likes. So who is Dr. Seuss? Asking about political figures. Who's the most famous president of the USA? Um, and so he's starting to diversify his questioning and explore these different lines of practice and these different topics instead of emphasizing specific ones in this period of his questioning. Um, so if you can go to the next slide and we can, we can focus in on six and seven. Uh, so there is a, he's starting to shift a little bit back towards manufacturing and technology, asking um, how metal is made, uh, but also starting to connect to zoology and the behaviors and functions, not of his own body, but of the animals that he sees around him. Um, so, or, or animals that he, he learns about through school or wherever. Um, one of the examples is what does a turtle's brain look like? So in numbers, uh, in point seven for his trajectory, you can start to, to see, um, Point seven on, you can see changes towards distinct directions. So seven is in in a relatively central location. Eight is pulled towards anatomy. Then you can see nine goes up towards history. Ten gets pulled a little bit more down towards history and astronomy. And this is uh, this is evident in the questions that he starts to ask. So in, in around questions eight, he's asking things like, "How do babies develop? How did people begin their lives on Earth?" Nine, he starts asking, and again, these are increasing in their complexity. Um, in they're becoming more abstract as well, um, so less related to things that he concretely sees or knows about himself. Who are our ancestors? Was a question he asked um, in the nine time period. Uh, and then number ten, he's starting to ask. Uh, he's really starting to engage with that astronomy that will become more and more apparent over time. Why do stars explode? What did Neil Armstrong do? So making explicit connections between some of these topics as well. Um, so then if you see 11 is pulling up even more complex and it's asking questions about um, how do, and you can start to see here that the, the questions he's asking are building upon each other. So here he asked a question like, how is the brain work? And then he followed up, how does the middle portion of the brain work after they explored the different parts of the brain? And then how do the nerves in the brain work? And so he's building upon this knowledge by asking more and more complex and detailed questioning. And then finally, towards the end, uh, when I love this part, is he starts to shift the type of questions he's asking. Uh, and he starts to ask hypotheticals. And I just love that he's thinking in the hypothetical and also the questions are just fantastic. Like, what if humans weighed a ton? 
or what if um, you know all ha what ha would happen if all humans disappeared from the earth? Uh, and so he's thinking uh, about these these really like, even more abstract hypothetical situations, and that's just one of my favorite things. Um, and so that gives you a little bit of a sense, hopefully, of what this trajectory means for him, and you can almost trace it as he's exploring these different lines of curiosity over time. All right, so there's so much for us to reflect on and so much for us to sort of build upon from many different angles, you know, how can we better, um, you know, sort of continue this routine so that we can developmentally support Ridan as, you know, he sort of becomes more complex in his questioning, becomes more um, sort of detailed in his examination of the world around him. And, um, okay, that, yeah, I saw your, um, your signal, Karen. Um, so a couple of things that we want to highlight in terms of what uh, Amanda and Amanda and I have done in terms of next steps and how we are thinking um, to sort of continue this project. One is, so this is a snapshot of um, the, 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 the questioning or the memoing process that we're doing in when Ridan is in grade one right now. And so you clearly see a big difference in the way the data is organized, the metadata that is put, a lot more details in terms of the memoing process, you know, why he asked some questions and he is in that position to answer those questions now than he was in the past. Uh, he's able to think about why he asked those questions, what prompted him, uh, what kind of books does he want to read during that time, and if, whether or not there's a connection between the books he reads and the questions he asks. Um, also, one other thing is that um, in the 2018-19 timeframe, the only time I intervened was uh, when he kept asking questions about um, too many about how how something happens or you know how something is made. That's the only time I offered um, sort of a advice that you know there are different ways or different kinds of questioning. There's a what kind of question. There's a when. There's a why. But in here in the 2020 and 21 phase, the only other um, sort of you know intervention that I've offered is that you know I asked him as you're growing older, it's okay to spend time on one question over a longer period. Um, and that's a decision I wanted him to make, but I wanted to offer that that's a possibility too, that if he wants to spend more time exploring a question in depth versus you know hopping from one question to the other. So he has um, sort of decided not to, and he wants to be able to ask a different question each night. Um, and also since he's older and he sort of, he wants to ask more questions every night. So we, we're also seeing many shifts in terms of the number of questions he wants to ask. Um, and also the role of, um, you know, who reads. So initially we had the column of the parent because in the 2018-19 timeframe, it was just me who um, logged the information or the data, but we were hoping that we could actually bring in my husband who also is a very involved parent to uh, log some of that information also. But we are all, I almost have to, um, modify the parent column because Ridan is taking over the reading portion now. So he reads the books and then I'm the one in charge or whichever the parent is putting him to sleep is in charge of the question and the answer seeking part. Um, sort of hand over to okay. Amanda then. So uh, we're currently uh, exploring different ways to understand and represent these patterns over time. So uh, this is one representation we've been playing around with. Uh, one thing we might uh, want to look into is direct DNA, which would allow us to visualize the sequence of codes, as well as the ability to model when a single code occurred uh, back to back in a sequence. Click. So there are certain times when you see these bursts, uh, where there's a bunch of uh, him saying the same topic uh, back to back, uh, and currently ENA is unable to model that. Um, these back-to-back -back sequences, it doesn't allow co-occurrences to the same code, and so direct DNA might be a useful piece. Um, so that's one of the things we're looking uh, to do. Uh, also expanding more of our analysis, of, it's doing more of the qualitative analyses and writing those up. And uh, to round things off, I think my fine, my favorite thing about this project is that we were actually able to use the epistemic networks that we that we developed around this this um, process of exploring his curiosities as a form of member checking with Ridan. So I actually had a session via Zoom with him where I showed him the epistemic networks of his tra trajectories of exploration over time. Uh, he initially told me that he did not understand them at all, which 
I understand. <laughs> but it, it quickly following after that, we were able to talk about uh, what a thicker line means versus what a thinner line means. And then we were able to even explore some of the topics uh, and some of the patterns that we noticed in the epistemic network together. So for example, we, he didn't know the word um, anatomy. So we were able to talk about what that means, what that category means and what the questions he was asking are that relate to that topic. Um, so he, he shared a lot that he really likes the, the framework of this uh, a bedtime curiosity. Um, but I think this is a really interesting um, topic to consider is how we, how we can make these networks perhaps more approachable for young people to understand their own processes of growth and change. Um, and even though he, he ended his chat with me shortly after that, after we, um, uh, we had talked about anatomy, uh, apparently, according to Mumta, he followed up with her on some of the themes that we identified together in our discussion. Uh, and it showed that he was really thinking about the patterns and his own processes. And I just think that that's uh, so exciting and something that we should explore and that needs to happen more with young people um, thinking intentionally about their learning. So. Thank you. I hope this has been a fun story for um, all of you to actually go check out our paper. Nice. That's a very creative way of using uh, this process. And what a wonderful thing for you as a parent, Mamta. <laughs> so we're going to quickly make the transition from preschoolers and first graders to secondary students, uh, Jen Skiana, David Gagnon, and Mariah Knowles. Take it away, Jen. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I just want to thank everybody who's still uh, hanging in there after a long day of amazing sessions. Um, so yeah, I am here to talk a little bit about um, doing QE in the context of gameplay, specifically digital games. And on behalf of Field Day Lab, where I'm a research assistant now, uh, I would like to welcome you to Lakeland. So Lakeland is a um, online digital game that was originally developed with another lab here at UW uh, called the Scalable Systems Lab. And the purpose behind this game is actually that it sets out, let me, oh, thank you. Um, so it sets out to help students better understand uh, systems and specifically the system that is involved in algae blooms. Algae blooms are a large problem for Wisconsin lakes and have a pretty, pretty direct relationship to our dairy industry. And so we created a game space that allows students to explore those relationships. Now, one of the challenges of systems thinking as it's traditionally envisioned in secondary science classrooms is that there are these constraints of temporal and spatial relationships that make it incredibly hard for students to wrap their mind around concepts. So if we think about some of the natural systems that students might be asked to think about, uh, a phenomenon such as an algae bloom typically doesn't occur over the course of a day or an hour of class or even a year, they might not be able to fully visualize that phenomenon. And additionally, the place or the source of the problem may be entirely different from where that problem actually takes place. And so for a middle school student to look at uh, watershed maps and things like that, it can be really challenging. We work in Lakeland to actually eliminate some of those challenges by ensuring that students stay uh, spatially close to the lake and also giving them the opportunity to control time. So when you look at the top of this here, um, students have the option to both let their game play out in a normal way when they're not being bugged by their advisors, uh, telling them to play their, pause their game or do whatever they need to do through the tutorials, but they do have the ability to fast forward and to pause and it, kind of control destiny in their little town that they're trying to establish. So eventually students are able to get to the point where they have a fully functional town. Now, the more things that are added to their space, the more they actually have to respond. You can see that my little people here are running amok. They're swimming through the lake. They're um, yelling at me that they're hungry. 
And so each time one of those little farm bits, as we call them, provides feedback, it's an opportunity for students to think about what is happening in their system and how does that system either moving in the direction they want it to, or is there something that they might need to change? And you can see that as I'm playing through the game here, I have some options. I'm switching some of my products from the farm to be fed to my cows instead of to be consumed by my people. I'm buying new farms and I'm controlling the system at play. So what this made me think of, the more that I watch students play, is one, it's very rare that students who are playing Lakeland are actually able to uh, be successful the first time that they play. And so we would see a lot of repeat times that they would go through this game. And I started to wonder how do these player responses to the in-game feedback change from one game to the next? What are they doing differently as they learn more about the system and start to uncover the underlying relationships? And what, if anything, can that tell us about their understanding? And I was fortunate to stumble upon this concept of the circle of gameplay um, that Heaton wrote about in terms of a player taking an action and they're having some form of input to the game. And the game system in response has an output back to them. And so using this as a framework of almost a conversation between player and game, we're able to um, utilize some of the same techniques that we otherwise could for discourse analysis and the like. So the data that I chose to collect was raw log data from, um, we publish all of our game data open source uh, to open game data. And so I took an entire month and in each of these raw logs, I had events that looked like this. So they look like farm harvested at tile 24, 30, 23 um, items, which would have been corn are marked for use and use, which means that they're meant for uh, the little farm bits to be able to consume them. And so hundreds of these rows occur within a given game session. And so in an effort to make sure that I was looking at at least similar size games and also games that represent student uh, typical play, I really wanted to limit it down to um, sessions that existed between five and 45 minutes. And I also was only looking at sessions where players took at least 20 actions, because by the time that you get through at least 20 actions, you're probably invested in the game and you've had at least a little bit of free choice in terms of what you can do within the system. So with those parameters, I then just picked randomly eight session IDs that had both first and second games within the given data set. So what we were left with is um, looking at player one, two, three, for example, the first time that they play, and then again, the second time. When we were considering what codes to actually look at, this was a source of growth for us all, I think, in that it's an interesting proposition to begin coding log data. You, every log is the same, right? So a given event is a given event. For example, Lucy, which would be the name of one of the farm bits because they all have names, um, at 2626, I've got my floaty on, it's where they have their little swim emoji. Or for example, this little guy, would have just eaten a little piece of corn. So he's got his yum face on. And once you agree on a given code, that stay is the same the entire time as you go through the log because there's no variation in the way that those uh, rows are going to appear. They're generated by the computer. And so we went through both, um, Mariah and myself had had experience uh, watching students play this game in person during play testing. And we also went through and played it ourselves and had almost a think aloud protocol where we were sitting there saying, this is why I'm taking this action. And this is what I think that the game is trying to communicate to me. And what we did with those conversations is we finally settled on these codes using also the comments that were in the code base by both the data um, team that created the log files as well as the developer who created the game. So 
things that were marked as being positive farm bit uh, codes were things where um, the farm bits were showing satisfaction with life. So either they were like had their little yum face because they were full or they were like happy because they were going to market for a sale or things like that. Negative farm bit emotions were things like this, where we have a little farm bit who looks sleepy. Um, later on in the game, when you have an algae bloom, you actually get a little like puke emoji that occurs whenever the uh, <laughs> farm bit goes into the lake because, you know, algae blooms are kind of gross. The um, other ways that the game can provide feedback is in how your farms are actually doing. So you can see in this little image here, we have two different farms. One of them has red as part of it and one of them is black. So any of the farms that had this black meter was actually showing that it was a farm that was in fail status, which means that there's not enough nutrition on that farm in order to produce at an optimal rate, which is trying to make the connection for the player between manure, nutrients, and the need to put fertilizer on crops. In terms of player actions that they're able to take, as I mentioned before, they're able to manipulate time so they can change the um, game speed and specifically when the player changes the game speed. They're also able to partake in different types of solutions for their town. So they can partake in short-term solutions where they're buying resources like just buying a food instead of planting a farm or just buying fertilizer instead of producing their own fertilizer via buying a dairy. And so we have that contrast between short-term and self-sustaining solutions. We also have the ability for them, as I mentioned before, to manage their resources. So we wanted to see how do players actually utilize these options in response to the game feedback. We look at each session ID and we split out the um, actions that players could take between games and players. And then we compare between game one and two. I did use a conversation size of the entire game when creating my ENA model and a window size of 10 because there are so many events that can happen simultaneously. I wanted to make sure that we weren't missing any player responses to events that just happen to like roll out all at the same time. And 10 events seem to be a middle ground where um, the amount of time on average that had passed within 10 events was not uh, too far apart. So when we start to look at game one and two, there are some um, similarities that we notice. There are connections between time manipulation and of course positive farm bit feedback because there is a lot of farm bit feedback. Your farm bits are always giving feedback. So we also see uh, connections between negative farm bit feedback and positive farm bit feedback for that reason. One of the more interesting pieces that I noticed was how resource management is connected more, um, it is connected in both, but we see it incredibly strong in this game two um, as opposed to game one. When we look at the difference plot of these two uh, is where I think that things are a lot more interesting. Um, time manipulation is here almost exclusive to uh, game one players in how they're using it. And it's almost always in response to positive farm bit feedback, which is what I was not expecting. I was expecting it to be more um, in connection to either resources or um, in response to negative farm bit feedback. And while we see that, it's definitely stronger in connection to the positive farm bit feedback. We do see time manipulation connected to new resources but it's for game two players. And I thought that that was really interesting that the new resources were uh, coming in response to the players um, either speeding up or slowing down the game once they had already played. Additionally, we do see a uh, stronger presence for resource management in game two. I found that this uh, type of graph with separating out the games and the players 
it creates almost a like bipartite graph if you're familiar with those, which is really interesting. It just is the like dichotomy of having all of the game events on one half and all of the player events be on the other half of the axes. We can see them split here on the y axis. Um, and of course, that because this is a means rotation uh, depiction here, we have the x axis being everything on to the left as you're looking at it being more aligned with game one and everything to the right being more aligned with game two uh, and more self-sustaining solutions. So what does this actually mean that we see it, uh, time manipulation being more tied to positive farm bit feedback for game one players and time manipulation being more tied to new resources for game two players? And when I went to go um, back and look at data to see what was happening because it didn't quite align with what I was expecting, this is an example of a vignette that I saw in my data. So a player experiences a farm harvest where they get new resources. They then see more new resources appear. And this is a game one player. So lots of things being produced, lots of corn showing up on their board with all of that production, they are able to actually sell one of them. And at that point, so their little farm bit leaves to go off on sale, they pause the game. And they wait. <laughs> um, and in the interim, there were some events that had happened that were not necessarily coded. It was that uh, they had been in the middle of a rainstorm and play picks, they go ahead and hit play. And now they go back to um, embark in resource management. And so I found this really interesting that they, everything looked like it was going fine in terms of how their game was progressing, but they felt the need to pause and wait. In game two, on the other hand, this player is having a lot of positive farm bit feedback they go in and manage their resource right away. They're deciding to, that they're going to mark something for sale. Their little farm bit goes to leave, providing more positive feedback. And instead of pausing there, they actually speed up the game because they want to get to the next time that they're going to have new resources to actually be able to do something with. And so we see them run it in fast mode through getting new resources, getting more positive feedback, and then they go back to play once they're able to um, have more things to actually manage. So I think that this is really interesting that the second time that players actually go through Lakeland, they use time manipulation differently and were more adept at managing the game system than the first time players were. They were able to actually use time manipulation to um, better manage their the system in their town uh, instead of having to like pause it and try to process everything that was going on. So some considerations that uh, just in thinking about this, despite the fact that uh, there were thousands of lines of data, it is still a relatively small data set because we're only looking at eight players. Um, and I did limit this to the entire session. There, I'm just gonna backtrack for a second. If you notice in this graph, some of these first time players actually do uh, stride quite over, uh, far over towards the game two. And part of me wonders if that's, that they are actually players who are adept from the very beginning and we're actually just seeing growth um, towards the end of their session. And if we segmented their gameplay out, if we would actually see their trajectory move across that space. Um, and of course, there's always the opportunity for additional applications, different coding schemes that integrate things like player typology or uh, integrating other data mining techniques with this data. But thank you. Well, what a fun project, Jen. <laughs> I, I also noticed on your subtractive uh, graph there, 
this is in support of your hypothesis that there was a lot more variability in that first game. So it is clear that there was this range of um, of capability when they're when they're starting in on this new one, but then it very rapidly sort of comes together. So it it sort of looks as though there's pretty rapid learning with this. Um, that's that's pretty interesting. I noticed that too. So interesting. It's like convergence and then also kind of enculturation in terms of understanding the game space and how it functions. Very cool. It made me think of um, some of Arudis's work. Um, Jen, our academic advisor, Amanda, and my um, doctoral and postdoctoral advisor, some of his doctoral work focused on uh, player types, just you know how players engage with the game and you know the kind of motivational orientations they bring in uh, by way of their player types. And you know, of course, at that time, you know, he didn't have the luxury of um, ENA, but you know this the observation that you made really made me think of his work and um i think it's was, it was really fascinating to see some the shifts that you that you made um observations about thank you yeah i would be super fascinated to dive a little bit more into player typology right now i don't I uh, feel quite confident enough to develop a coding scheme for what those events would look like and how to um, categorize. And it, it's going to change based on the different game space. Um, but one of the things that I plan on exploring in the future is how sequences of events actually indicate um, can be coded differently. And how we can use that within game spaces. Thank you, Barbara. It, re it reminds me a bit of um, the work that uh, Shamia, did you attend her talk, Karambaya, earlier? Um, and I don't know if she's doing it this this uh, this ICQ, but last time we, we worked on a paper together with Physics Playground and I'm looking at, I thought she did a really interesting, it was an interesting way to show runs of activities and how they connect to each other in the play space. Um, I also think that, yeah, typologies would be a really interesting direction to take this, but I don't know how, how valuable like Bartle might be, for example, because that, that's, you know, it's referencing behaviors that might not happen in your game space. So it'd be really interesting to think about what kinds of categories of players exist. Have you interviewed any of the players? I'm guessing you probably have spoken to some. Yeah, we have. Um, that's actually one of the uh, other next steps is that we're also looking at this from an evaluation lens of how it, this is a really niche uh, content, I guess, to try to express uh, systems thinking. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you noticed any of the text from the advisors, but it's very Wisconsin themed. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> so um, we're also oh. investigating, actually, I think that Stefan is working on this data set right now. Uh, oh, really? We have some surveys that- um, He's here, I should call him over. <laughs> ask what, uh, what players are involved in at school. So are they members of 4-H? Are they members of uh -huh. FFA? Are they part of environmental clubs? And how does that actually influence perhaps their motivations within the game space? Are they mm -hmm. more committed to certain strategies than others? Um, I mean, that stuff's my jam. I love that you're doing that yeah. because I, I love affinity space work and thinking, thinking broad and bigger than just the in-game space about how people are participating in these communities. Games are obviously a crucial part, but yeah, I love that you're thinking critically about other ways that they're participating, um, especially because Madison, I know, really encourages citizen science, science citizenship. There we go. <laughs> well, in citizen science, right, it, it, it is seems to maybe have been a precursor to the game you're playing or maybe some of the same people were working I on. thought I thought that yeah it, there's it's reminiscent it's it's some of the similar complex thinking but uh, approaching it in a different way similar model but more I think it, it seems to provide more flexibility for the student which I think yes Jennifer was really good at like showing all of these pieces like how dynamic it is and all that you know I, I can't wait to read the paper I, same I, you more than you did not overpromise. 
<laughs> Not at all. So. Also, may I say, what a beautiful game space. My goodness. Right? Yeah. Jen, do you have a sense of the typical age where some some kids more attracted to it than others? That's a really great question. Um, so it was initially developed with the grade band of like grade seven to nine as being a target audience. But I, during play testing, um, I've worked with kids as young as fourth grade uh, that were part of a coding camp. That was actually how um, Mariah and I were able to have conversations with some of the younger kiddos. And I've used it with kiddos as old as incoming seniors in high school. And it, granted, they take different approaches and have different like things that they want to say about it, but um, it was actually engaging for all of them on some level. What, what tool did you use? Was it Kodu or one of the other uh, programming tools or games? For, uh, for the workshops you did with the, with the kids, or was it summer camps? Uh, it was one of the summer camps. Um, I forget, it's part of the Wickedy in Wisconsin, which is the Wisconsin okay. Center for Academically Talented Youth. Yep. And it, um, Mariah actually teaches some of those uh, classes and camps, so. Awesome. So Wickedy has been one of the favorite populations. Cody, I'm sure, remembers the name because they were uh, early users of land science, which became iPlan. Cool. I just, it feels like so yeah. cool, small world right now. Like I'm just- so It happy. really does, full circle. I love it. <laughs> have, you, have you implemented this game in classrooms? Is that- um... Yeah, I mean, it's live on the web for anybody who wants to play it. Oh. Um, yeah. We know one little kid who might. <laughs> yeah, I, I, che one. I checked it out. I uh, I didn't have time to uh, to do much with it, but I thought, oh, this looks like fun. Maybe my grandson and I will play it. <laughs> oh, thank you. I see the link. Yeah. So, so Jen, do you have any sense of the different goals that that um, your seniors versus your elementary school kids were were bringing to it? I, I know this is pushing you a little bit, but just any speculation? Um. So I think that the granted the elementary school kiddos had the opportunity to jump in and uh, interact with some of the code base. That's actually how uh, some of the names that are in the game are remnants from that particular play test that just never got dropped back out. Um, <laughs> and so they were more interested in the technical features of like the economy and just because of the space that we were in that um, they were thinking about what changes could they make? What could they do to improve it at that given moment? Uh, my seniors were one trying to avoid any other work in that they were supposed to be doing for class. Uh, so we're perhaps a bit more invested than they otherwise would have been. But I think that a large part of what they were bringing was one comparison to a lot of other games that they played. So I had students who are really active um, like in Minecraft, for example, that were like, okay, I, I understand something about this type of space, or um, there are a couple other farming games that are really popular that they would draw on their experience in those and see how the strategy is aligned, um, but also had preconceived notions of what would be best for the town. So I had one student who was a like for example a vegan and this is one of the things that inspired like this correlating between surveys and they were like i am not buying a dairy because i refuse to participate in that economy <laughs> and so well, this they child were lives in wisconsin that. huh <laughs> yep yep oh my goodness the time has flown <laughs> 